to Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22. And as I said, we're going to finish up, uh, I believe, this evening, uh, chapter 22. Uh, I've got 18 points for you this evening that uh, is a good uh, understanding of the illegality of the trials at the hands of the Jewish religious leaders uh, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so as we wrap up the narrative in Luke's Gospel in verses 66 through 22, in regard to the third trial at the hands of the Sanhedrin, the entire Jewish council, uh, I'm going to uh, speak about how all three of the trials that they had, including the arrest and also uh, the trials before Herod as well, how they all were illegal in nature. So uh, just to remind you again of the scene, here we have the scene of the uh, trials, the first two trials in the bottom left-hand corner at the hands of Annas and Caiaphas. They were down in Caiaphas's uh, palace down there. Then they brought Jesus through the city, uh, past where Herod was, uh, excuse me, where Pilate was staying, at uh, Herod's uh, uh, original palace, and then bringing him to the temple in that room inside the temple, down on one of the uh, first or second floors inside of that, below the tabernacle, where they had the third trial in the gathering of the Sanhedrin. And in regard to that, that uh, place that was called the hewn out of the rock. Uh, chamber. That is where the Sanhedrin would meet. There would be a total of 70 uh, leaders of the Jewish religious uh, leadership that were part of the Sanhedrin, plus the high priest, as you can see, sitting on the uh, priestly throne there. That would make up a body of 71 individuals that would hear uh, very important cases, especially those like this one, that were capital cases uh, that needed to be determined. And so this is the scene of where Jesus Christ was standing at the point that we're reading in Luke's Gospel 22, verses 66 through 71. And this was the final trial that the Jews held, and then they ushered him off to Pilate because they weren't allowed at that point in time, as it appears, to bring about a capital punishment a penalty to a criminal as they would see fit. So as we go back, and let's read the narrative one last time, as it says in Luke chapter 22, 66, it says, And when it was day, the council of elders of the people assembled both chief priests and scribes, and they led him away to their council chamber, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask a question, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And they all said, Are you the Son of God then? And he said to them, Yes, I am. And they said, What further need do we have of testimony? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. And then uh, just jump down to chapter 23, verse 1. It says, Then the whole body of them arose and bought, brought him before Pilate. And so we'll get into that uh, on Sunday morning in some detail. We'll talk a little bit about that this evening. But as I uh, mentioned at the outset, what I wanted to share with you in this final note or uh, study of these three trials is the illegality of these trials according to Jewish law. And remember, under Jewish law, we have the Old Testament, and it's certainly the law that is found in the book of Leviticus, the book of Deuteronomy, and then somewhat in the book of Numbers as well, part of the Mosaic law. That is what God gave to the people of Israel to govern their society. And remember, there are three codes to that law, and uh, the code that we're talking about is the civilian code that would talk about the judicial system and how they would try civilian uh, crimes that would be committed within the society. So uh, basically, as we've noted, in these first two trials of Jesus Christ, they were by night. Now this one came early in the morning, again at daybreak we would understand, but even in regard to that we'd see all kinds of illegalities as the main reason for these trials being corrupt and unjust as we know. 
but there's much more to it uh, based on a review of the Mosaic Law and then also what we call the Oral Law, which was written down between 100 and 300 A.D. that is now called the Mishnah by the Jewish people. And that oral law was basically the rabbis interpreting the law of Moses in applicable actions when they would be in a court of law or even in society as well. So the oral law is what was passed down by word from generation to generation as to how to conduct these things, how to conduct the trials, how they go about them. And then because of the dyspora that happened beginning in 70 A.D. and really happened uh, for, uh, once and for all in 123 B.C., uh, excuse me, A.D., at that point in time they decided to start to write down the oral law so they wouldn't lose that law. They wouldn't lose the applicable principles to how the Mosaic law is interpreted and how they conduct their, their uh, governance and their civil society as a nation. So again, they started to write that down between 100 and 300 A.D. And since then, there's been some additional uh, uh, writings added to it as we know. But uh, what's important about that is that in regard to both the law of Moses that we have in the Bible that we can read for ourselves, but also the Mishnah, and I'm sure none of you have a Mishnah hanging around in your bookshelves back at home, okay? Uh, but you can go online and read it and see it and understand these things. And what I have done is taken some of that uh, uh, you know, from the Mishnah and compared it uh, to what Jesus Christ uh, went through during these trials and then also seeing some other people write about this online as well and bringing that into all of this. So really I've brought a lot of different resources together to give you what I'm going to share with you this evening, both not only the principle but also the scriptures that go along with it. Again, this won't be an exhaustive study, uh, but ultimately it gives us a good glimpse into the illegality of these trials. And remember, this was a capital offense, which means punishable by death. And typically, that would be stoning, but they could also burn people back in the day, or they could strangle people back in the day, uh, according to the Jewish law. So, but this was a capital trial, which means punishable by death. And basically, because it was a capital trial, it had even more unique rules associated with it. And you can see that within the Mishnah. And as you read the Mishnah, it says, in regard to trials and procedures, if you have a civil case that's a monetary case, you do it this way. But if it's a capital case, you do it another way. And so it tells you that plainly within the Mishnah. And, and again, going through that and seeing a lot of that, I'm bringing that to you in regard to the capital trials that would occur by the Sanhedrin back in the day. Now, when you understand this, there are scholars that say there are at least 18 of uh, uh, portions of the Mosaic Law that were broken during these three trials, plus as they brought him to uh, Pontius Pilate to get him tried by Pontius Pilate. And even that was at the hands of the Pharisees. So even the Pharisees, when they brought Jesus, and again, I'll just give you that one real quickly, you know, they blamed him of blasphemy or they convicted him of blasphemy in their court. But when they go to Pilate, they now are uh, accusing him of treason against the Roman Empire. And again, if a Jew was committing treason against the Roman Empire, the Sanhedrin would be all for it. They wouldn't be having him stoned to death. They'd be for it because they didn't like the Romans either. So again, we see the lie and the change of verdict after the case was completed or they came to a conclusion. And then therefore they're lying and changing just to get rid of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But again, there's at least 18 of these Mosaic laws. What's kind of interesting about that, the number nine throughout Scripture is the number of judgment. And so now you're doubling that. So the double emphasis of judgment is in view here. But in this case, as I'll say, the bastardization of judgment, the injustice and the illegality of the judgments that they brought against him based on comparison to what they should have done according to the Mosaic Law. So now I'm going to give you those 18 things. And again, if, you, uh, if you're handwriting notes, it's going to be hard to keep up, but I, you, I do pass out the notes. And again, if you like the notes, those online especially, just email me and I'll put you on the notes list and uh, get you in, in, uh, 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 up in line with that. 
But in any case, we begin with the first one. Now, the first thing that they did was that any sort of bribery would disqualify a member of the court. And what did they do? Well, basically, they made a deal with Judas Iscariot to pay him 30 pieces of silver to turn in our Lord and Savior, and then also use Judas Iscariot to arrest him. So the Pharisees, the high priests, the scribes, the Pharisees, we see them all involved in a bribery to accuse Jesus and to try him in the first place. And as I'll say, to arrest him as well. So they totally broke the law by doing that right off the bat. Making a deal with Judas Iscariot to, uh, to turn Jesus in or to betray Jesus Christ breaks the law. And so therefore I've given you the scriptures here in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and also we read about it in the books of Acts, the after fact in regard to Judas himself, how he received 30 pieces of silver to betray our Lord, and he received that from the Sanhedrin and leaders of the Sanhedrin. Not all of them, but the leaders of the Sanhedrin and certainly the high priests. So that right away makes this an illegal arrest and an illegal trial. Therefore, any verdict that would come would be nullified. Number two, Jesus was not arrested on any formal charges of any crime. There was no charge presented to them when they met him in the Garden of Gethsemane. There was no a, a warrant for his arrest, no statement of what he had done. They simply went up to him and seized him and led him away just because they did not like him and really because they hated him profusely. So again, according to the Jewish law, no formal charges were given to him as now he's going into a court of law. What are you charging me of? And basically they just started asking questions right away and they wanted him to self-condemn. And they also tried to bring in false witnesses. We'll see that in just a minute. And they tried to have any form or fashion of conviction against him, yet they did not charge him formally uh, during any of these trials. They just brought him in, and they started to abuse him, rebuke, uh, 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 to verbally and physically uh, abuse him, as we see. Actually, let me go back to that real quick. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and also John. You see the passages there. Now, we've read all four of the gospel accounts of the trials, and certainly these three trials, and also of the arrest of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But these passages that I give you are specifically related to each one of these illegal processes in their arrest and trial of our Lord Jesus Christ. Point number three is that those who were involved in Christ's arrest included the priests and the elders. Okay, So they were the ones that were arresting him and then bringing him before the court. Now they also, being part of the court, were doing what? Acting as judges. The law says you can't do that. You can't accuse somebody of a crime and then be their judge. Okay, You can't do it. Okay. The judge has to be impartial. He has to be separated from the prosecution. He has to be separated from the defense. But they were the ones who arrested him. They were the ones who accused him. And they're the ones that are also being the judge. And you ever know, you know, you know the old saying, you can't be the judge, jury, and the executioner all at one, okay? You can't have that, okay? That's an illegal trial, especially in our country as well, but it was according to the law. Let me also remind you that many of the laws that we have and the jurisprudence of our Lord comes from this, comes from the Jewish law and how they operated and how they functioned in their system of court and what the Word of God says in regard to crimes and ab about treating criminals in a court of law or the accused in the court of law and then also sentencing and judgment. It at least started out that way, and again, we know we're far ways off of that today. But in any case, no one uh, uh, was accu uh, accusing him could be his judge, yet that's what they did. We see in Matthew, in the Gospel of Mark, and then also in the Gospel of Luke. Now we get to number four. And number four is interesting, is that the trial was held at Caiaphas's palace instead of a proper court. Remember, he went before Annas first, then he went uh, before Caiaphas. And then they brought him to the high court of the Sanhedrin. 
or really the only court because, again, those other two individuals really don't have a court as it were. So they tried to be a puppet court. They thought they could get rid of Jesus right then and there. But because they realized, too, that they were uh, operating illegally, at least hypocritically illegally, all right, then they decided to bring him before the entire Sanhedrin and try him before the entire court. Even that there are some questions about because we believe that there are individuals that who were believing in Jesus Christ did not approve and go along with what occurred to Jesus Christ by the Sanhedrin were part of the Sanhedrin. And that's why we see Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, and we have statements about them that they did not consent into what the rest were doing. And I'm sure there were others as well who believed in Jesus as the Messiah and Savior. And therefore, when they came together as an en entire court, they weren't all present. There probably weren't the 70 and 71 individuals necessary for a court because they might not have invited some of these people. I'm going to see that. We're going to show that in just a minute. Uh, or they might not have uh, asked them to this or they had no say in what was happening. So, again, even the amount of people at the court were inappropriate. But the first two trials were inappropriate because they were held by Annas and Caiaphas individually. And again, with their henchmen being around them and maybe a couple of the other, you know, Pharisees that were there at the time to accuse Jesus and to uh, blame him and try to convict him. But ultimately, uh, their trials were illegal because they were not held in a proper courtroom as it should be. So Luke, Matthew and Mark speaks to that. Then we also see and again, uh, I'm going to show you, let me just say this too, like starting with this one, I'm going to show you some of the writings in the Mishnah that are related to each of these points, but all of the other points, even though I haven't given you a quote from the Mishnah, believe you me, it's part of that or part of the law that you'll find in the Old Testament. And sometimes I've given you the Old Testament passages as well. All right, so number five, Jesus was arrested and tried secretly at night. And therefore, no legal proceeding could be placed at night. We've talked about this one. This seems to be the primary one that everybody likes to point to as to why these trials were illegal by Annas and Caiaphas. And then why those two individuals ushered them off to the overall Sanhedrin to try to legitimize their condemnation of Jesus Christ. And so in the Mishnah, in regard to the Sanhedrin, how the Sanhedrin is governed and how it should operate in the fourth section, we read what it says, and I'll show you that in just a minute, but we also compare that to what they did to Jesus in Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, and then also in the Gospel of John 13.30. <clears throat> we know they took him by night. We know that the first two trials were by night. We see Peter by the fire at night. And then at daybreak, at morning, they went to the Sanhedrin. So, again, that illegitimized those trials. So what does it say in the Mishnah? Well, here under the fifth point for the Mishnah, the Mishnah reads, In cases of capital law, the court judges during the daytime and concludes the deliberation and issues the ruling only in the daytime. Okay? So they couldn't make a ruling or a judgment at night. They weren't to try at night, nor have a judgment at night. These individuals tried to do that, and then they recognized it. Somebody pro probably brought it to their attention. So now they, ush they get the whole Sanhedrin, or as much of the Sanhedrin together, in their puppet court, and then try Jesus once again. Now the sixth point is that the testimony of an accomplice was not allowed in these courtrooms. Therefore, since Judas was one of the disciples, he could not bring evidence or be a witness against Jesus Christ, yet he was the one to conspire with the Pharisees to arrest him and identify him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it's kind of interesting, too, when you think about it. Remember how there were two disciples that were around those first two trials? One is named Peter, and we see his three denials. The other goes unnamed. You know, we talk about John being that person a lot. We assume it's John, but it could have been Judas. Because remember, Judas conspired with them to arrest Jesus, so therefore he had a relationship with them. Later on, 
it tells us that Judas saw what they did to Jesus and condemned him to death, especially in front of Pilate. So Judas at least was hanging around for the beginning parts of the trials and then committed his uh, attempt of suicide before the crucifixion. So it could have been Judas there as the other disciple, but again, we'll only find that out truly for sure when we get to heaven. Many think it's John, but again, it could have been Judas because we see scriptures that say he was around, and when he saw what they did to Jesus, he then had remorse, and instead of remorse for repentance, he tried to hide from it, and he thought by killing himself, he would uh, be done with his misery. But as you know, he must not have been a believer whatsoever in the Messiah, even though he didn't believe in Jesus, any Messiah, because he must not have recognized heaven versus hell. Okay? Or maybe he was arrogant and thought that his good works would get him into heaven. So, again, he killed him, or tried to kill himself, which he was unsuccessful with, thinking that maybe he'd go to heaven. But, again, we have no context of that within the Scriptures as to where he thought he was going by ending his life. But in any case, his testimony, his, uh, up, his uh, arrest of Jesus Christ and identifying Jesus Christ totally nullifies these uh, courtroom trials. So we see that in Matthew, Mark, and then also in the Gospel of John. Oh, excuse me, Matthew, Luke, and John are the three that speak to this. All right, then we have point number seven, where the accused cannot be questioned by a private individual. Therefore, when he was before Annas and then Caiaphas, again, illegal trials, because one individual, one individual, one individual. And that cannot happen. Again, you can't be tried by one individual according to the law. And you can't be questioned in private by that individual and then have that individual come up with a verdict that condemns you. Certainly not in a capital offense and really in any criminal offense as we know. The Gospel of John chapter 18 verse 13 and 19 and 24 speak to that. We see him going before Annas and Caiaphas. John's the one that really points out those two trials. And then in Matthew 26, 57 we see the, uh, the uh, conglomeration of that where he's before Caiaphas before they lead him off to Pilate. Now, in regard to that, what does the Mishnah have to say? Well, the Mishnah in Sanhedrin 1, the first section, uh, talks about, and it reads like this, The court judges cases involving an entire tribe that sinned, or a false prophet, and again, I underlined that in the notes, that's what we're talking about here, as Deuteronomy 18, uh, 20 through 21 speaks about, or a high priest who transgresses, who, who transgressed a prohibition. Now, again, talking about three groups there, but the false prophet is what we're noting here. It says that carries a possible death sentence only on the basis of a court of 71 judges can this be done. So therefore, if you have one individual, two individuals, and again, as, a, as I was reading the Mishnah, sometimes there could be three individuals, and then if the, if, if the trial got a little uh, confusing or overwhelming, they could bring in other judges in that, and they could keep doing that and bring judges in until they came up with a good verdict. But in this case, on a capital punishment, in regard to a false prophet, they needed 71. That's the great Sanhedrin, and that's why... Uh, Caiaphas convened the Sanhedrin to try to get rid of Jesus Christ. But again, it'll be interesting to find out when we go to heaven, were there really 71 people there? Or were they short the full court? Because again, they left some individuals out who were in favor of Jesus Christ. That too is another illegality of this trial that we're going to see a little later on. Number eight, the Sanhedrin could not bring charges. This is interesting. Witnesses had to, had to do that. But indeed, we see the Sanhedrin are the ones accusing Jesus Christ. They brought the charges against Jesus Christ. And they're also the jury and the judges. So again, illegitimizes the trial because they were acting in roles that they should not. You see, in the case of a criminal trial, an accuser has to come forward to accuse them. In our day and age, we have the prosecution, which is from the state. Okay, Then you have the defense. But the prosecution, many times, is uh, uh, there to represent the afflicted. 
Because many times, especially when there's a murder case, they can't stand up for themselves or speak for themselves. So the prosecution comes in and, uh, you know, uh, makes the case or makes the charge against the defendant. And the judge hears both sides of the case as an equal party to both parts, okay, as an independent judge. But here, the Sanhedrin, they were the ones, especially the high priest, who was sitting on the throne, that guy Caiaphas, who was sitting up on the throne. He was the one that condemned Jesus Christ. He was the one that conspired against Jesus Christ. He's the one bringing the charges against Jesus Christ before the whole Sanhedrin. Absolutely an illegal process. And again, this one kind of reminds me of what goes on in our society today, especially what we've been seeing down in Washington, D.C. as of late where those who are, uh, again, accusing uh, someone of a wrongdoing are also the ones that are judging them for that wrongdoing. And you can't have that, okay? And what we have going on right now with the uh, classified documents, of th you know, the current president, the last president took to their uh, private homes, yes, now they've gone on to what? Independent councils. And so that's a good thing. And when those independent councils operate, again, they're separated from the judge and the jury. And so whatever those independent councils find, then they can bring a case against either or both of the presidents for doing something illegal or wrong. But again, it gives an arm's length of separation somewhat. I won't get into any more detail of that, but in any case, in the Sanhedrin, you couldn't do that. You couldn't you know, accuse somebody of a crime and then be their judge. What kind of legal trial would that be? What kind of justice would that be? None whatsoever. So therefore, uh, that's why in our country, people have to uh, uh, recuse themselves from the trial or from the process because they're too close to the parties that are involved. So they step back and they say, I, I don't want to have anything. I can't have anything to do with it because I would not be an impartial judge in this situation. These guys, the Pharisees, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, high priests, they didn't care about any of that. They just went headlong into accusing Jesus Christ, knowing that they would judge him too. So again, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they all speak about that. And these are the verses where we see the accusation by the, the, the Sanhedrin who were also their judges, especially of Caiaphas, the high priest. What does the Mishnah have to say about that? Well, the Mishnah reads, In cases of capital law, the court opens the deliberations with a claim to acquit the accused, but it does not open the deliberation with a claim to find him liable. You know what we call that in our country? Innocent before proven guilty. You see, that's how they operated their, their courts when they were run legally. Innocent before proven guilty. And the court would not have a viewpoint of guilt before anything or any evidence was presented. They could only think of acquittal, in other words, innocence for the individual, and then you'd have to prove the guilt of the individual. And that's what we have in our court of law in the United States of America today. Our founding fathers did a wonderful job of writing that into the Constitution, taking it uh, from these principles and precepts. And that was one of the reasons we had not the Revolutionary War, but the War of Emancipation. Very different, okay? And the reason we emancipated from England is because England was having a court of law that was guilty before, and you would have to prove your innocence. And again, guilty, and you'd have to prove your innocence. So they would come in in a biased way to the court system, and therefore it really wasn't a court of justice whatsoever. God knew that. God gave that to these individuals in the law. And in the Mishnah, that was their law too, innocent, and then you'd have to prove them guilty. Innocent before proven guilty guilty. And the court would have to see them as innocent first, and then if evidence was presented, then they could deem them guilty. But again, this kangaroo court did not do that. They were guilty coming in, and they were just looking for things. And that's why they brought in all the false witnesses, and they couldn't get anybody co to cooperate, any evidence or information or whatsoever. And the best thing they came up, oh, we could destroy the temple in three days and rebuild it. Oh yeah, that's the best thing you can come up with? <laughs> oh, he's guilty, he's guilty, he's guilty. Okay? 
And then they asked Jesus Christ those poignant questions that we talked about on Tuesday. I'm going to show you that in just a minute, too, how those questions that they asked Jesus also illegitimized and made these trials illegal. So number nine, in the, uh, ecle the ecclesiastical law, it prohibited prohibited any member of the Sanhedrin from sitting in judgment of any accused if they had been personally dealing with the individual that might cause them to be impartial. Is that interesting? And again, talk about recusing yourself from a case. Okay, that is what I was talking about uh, a little earlier as well. It applies to this principle here. But what do we see these individuals doing? Well, they had all kinds of interaction with Jesus Christ. Remember, he went into the temple. And during his three-year ministry, he would come into the temple, certainly during the high holidays, every year. And we see him twice turning over the money-changing tables in the temple on two different Passover celebrations. And he did it with the last one that he was uh, there uh, in Jerusalem. And we see and have read and studied the interactions that Jesus Christ had with Caiaphas, had with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And we know that they had personal contact with him. So therefore, because of that, they could not be his judges. And they should have got a third party to come in that did not know Jesus and really not know them much either and then be able to sit and try the case. But they didn't do that again. They had a preconceived condemnation of Jesus Christ, as we read in the Scriptures, as a, in uh, some of these uh, passages that I gave you. Remember, in making the deal with Judas Iscariot, they were seeking how to destroy him. So again, illegitimizing and I making these trials so illegal in many different ways. It goes on, uh, this point also talks about that this law was to protect an accused from being tried before judges who were his enemies. And I gave you a lot of scriptures there in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in regard to uh, how they treated him during the trial. And then comparing that with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John pre-trial and pre-arrest of Jesus Christ and the interactions that they had in regard to Jesus Christ, how they hated him, how they wanted to destroy him. So again, just by their interactions alone disqualified them and disqualifies these trials of our Lord Jesus Christ. In regard to that, the missioner reads, In cases of capital law, the court may conclude the deliberations and issue the ruling even on that same day to acquit the accused, but must wait until the fi oh, am I not right? uh, I, I'm sorry, wrong one. Reading the wrong one. Let me get to, I'll get to that one in a minute. All right, this, this one reads, Nor under any circumstances is a man known to be at enmity with the accused person permitted to occupy a position among the judges. Okay, So again, under no circumstances is a man who is known to be at enmity or an enemy with the accused person is permitted to occupy the position among the judges. And again, the scriptures that I gave you in the previous slide, how they hated Jesus Christ, they wanted to destroy him. That alone disqualified them, but yet they kept going forward and they kept with the trial. All right, now number 10. And I'll read this mission to you in just a minute because it goes along with this one. Capital trials had to last also more than one day. This is very interesting. If somebody was be to be condemned to death, they would have not to just have a one-day trial. You know, they could maybe go through all the proceedings in one day, but as we're going to see, they could not bring about a judgment or a verdict in that same day. Why? Because of the gravity of the case. Somebody's life is at stake. So we're not just going to jump to the quick and find them guilty right away. Let's hear all the evidence. Let's go home at night, think about it, pray on it, and then we'll come back in the morning and see how the Lord has moved us in regard to the information to either find a guilty or innocent verdict. So they could not have a trial in one day. They had to give more time. And in regard to that, they had to give the accused all kinds of opportunity to justify or to defend themselves where they could bring in witnesses, they could bring in evidence, whatever the case may be. 
and outside of the notes, okay, let me give you this information too, which is kind of interesting, that in the Mishnah, it also talked about two other things. If they also found an individual guilty of a capital crime, they had to also wait another 30 days, okay, many times, to give that individual time and the whole overall court proceeding time to bring in more evidence or just in case there's some evidence that got missed. Remember, they didn't have all the science and technology that we have today, okay? So they needed to give this some time. And maybe a witness would come forward within that time period that would help or hurt the, the defendant in that case. So they had to give 30 days, and then they'd give a stay of pause. In addition to that, if they found somebody guilty, what they were to do was to take him outside of the courtroom Okay, and again, with all the time and the proceedings and everything, it, you know, uh, was done according to the law. Now they could find him guilty. Now the sentence could be enacted. They would take him out the courtroom to stone that individual to death. Okay, a couple interesting things about that. With the one that accused the person is the one to throw the first stone to kill them. Okay, but as that individual was being dragged out to be stoned to death. They could object to the stoning and say, but I think I can acquit myself. And if they would say, I think I can acquit myself, they'd have to go back into the courtroom, hear what he has to say, and then see if the verdict holds or they should overturn it. And it says in the mission they could do this up to five, six, seven times. But after a, a while. So what is that? That's the appeal of the trial of the sentencing, right? That's the appeal of the sentencing. And they could do that five, six, seven times. But once that was over, and once they gave it enough time, then if they couldn't acquit and there was still a guilty verdict after you know enough time had gone by with enough appeals, and every time they dragged him out to be stoned again, he could appeal. They drag him out again, he could appeal. They drag him out again, he could appeal. Okay. Finally, they'd say, as enough is enough, there's really no other information that's coming in. You are guilty, and we will stone you. Okay. So a one-day trial for a capital crime like Jesus's was absolutely unheard of. And not only was it, you know, a one, a more than a one-day trial, what do we see these individuals doing? They tried within an hour or two, maybe three. They didn't give a whole day, okay? <laughs> they were just within hours, and they're accusing him and finding him guilty just like that. He had no time to defend himself if he wanted to. Again, we know that he did not want to in this case. They asked him a few questions. He said, I'm not going to say anything. And then he did give information that was only in regard to witnessing the gospel in his remarks, as we talked about on Tuesday night, and doing it in a fantastic way to make them think about the gospel according to the law, and then come to salvation. But again, they did not give him any time at all to defend himself whatsoever. As his trial was in a few hours, they tried him, and they convicted him, and they sentenced him. Sentenced him to death. And again, the sentence to death uh, was the result of them dragging them off to Pontius Pilate so that Pilate ultimately could kill him. Got some interesting things coming up about that uh, that we'll talk about uh, maybe tonight, but uh, maybe a little bit later on. But in regard to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and also the Gospel of John, we see that. Now, the missionary. I started to read this one before. Let me read it now. It says, In cases of a capital law, the court may conclude the deliberation and issues the ruling even on that same day to acquit the accused, but must wait until the following day to find him liable. So if he's innocent, you could do all that in one day. But if he's guilty, you got to wait till the next day. So you got to wait. You got to wait. You got to wait. You got to wait. But they didn't. They had the rush to judgment, and they had the rush to condemn and to kill. This goes into the next point, which is interesting. Capital offenses should not be tried on a day of preparation for a Sabbath or a holy day or a feast or a festival, uh, you know, like Passover or the Feast of Unleavened Bread, as we have going on at this point in time. Capital offenses could not be tried on those days. Yet these guys were in the middle of their Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and all of that, and they committed the trial anyway. 
And there we see the hypocrisy of the Jews as well. Remember, they didn't want to go into the praetorian, uh, the, praetor, uh, the praetorium, okay? The jail cell and where the soldiers were. They didn't want to go into that place. Why? Oh, we'd be defiled. We won't be able to eat the Passover supper, okay? <laughs> so they didn't want to go do that. In the first place, they shouldn't have been having a trial. By having a trial, they've already defiled themselves because it's against the law. What does the missioner read about that? The missioner says, therefore, since capital cases might continue for two days. Okay? Are you all right, George? The camera's off? Okay. Did we, we, so we probably lost Facebook. All right. All right. We still got YouTube. All right. Thanks. Okay. There's nothing we can do about it once it goes off. Okay, so thanks. All right. <laughs> so, all right, so uh, the missioner reads, okay, Therefore, since capital cases might continue for two days, again, you know, you can have the trial on one day, but the verdict has to come on the second day. It says the court does not judge cases of capital law on certain days, neither on the eve of a sabbat nor the eve of a festival. And that's what they're doing. That's where they are, okay? They're not supposed to have trials during this time. But yet to get rid of Jesus, they're breaking their own rules, breaking their own law, just to get rid of him. All right, number 12. It says there had to be two or three witnesses agreeing, and we're pretty familiar with this one uh, because, again, the law says, as I'll give you the passage in the next uh, uh, slide, again, two or more Witnesses have to agree in order to find someone guilty. On the evidence of one person, you cannot find anyone guilty. Even in our court system, on, the, on, on one piece of evidence, you can't find someone guilty. You have to have at least two pieces of evidence. Now, and those would be considered witnesses in our day and age, especially with the science and the technology. If you've been uh, watching anything about the, uh, the, uh, the guy that uh, we believe murdered his wife here in Massachusetts in a very horrific way, or the Idaho murder, the two big uh, uh, cases that are going on right now, okay? They have to collect all kinds of evidence. In today's technology, we have fingerprints, we have DNA, we have molecules, we have all kinds of microscopic evidence that we can look at, blood matching, blood type. They didn't have any of that back in the day. You just had eyewitnesses and their word, okay? And you may have some pieces of evidence where you can say, well, this is his axe and it's got blood on it or something like, you know, something like that, okay? But again, they had to have two witnesses, we do that in our court system today, too. You can't convict on one piece of evidence. That's why even like when they call it habeas corpus, okay, if there's no body in a murder that is found, okay, sometimes you can't convict people because you're not finding the body, you're not finding that main piece of evidence. Maybe they're just off on a ship somewhere sailing around the world. Who knows, okay? But if you find enough other evidence that says, yeah, I don't think a murder happened here, you can convict even without a body. All right. So, again, had to be two or more witnesses. Uh, and then also, those who were the witnesses, and especially the accusers, to see the crime and the witnesses to the crime, if the person was found guilty, they'd be the first ones to throw the stone to kill the individual. Now, let me give you a little bit extra detail outside the notes, too, on this. All right. And again, in reading uh, some more about the Mishnah, it gives us context in regard to, remember back in Nazareth when Jesus read from the book of Isaiah and he said, before your eyes today, before your presence, this has been fulfilled. He basically said, I'm the Messiah and I'm beginning my ministry. What did they want to do? They took him out and they brought him to a cliff to stone him to death, to get rid of him. All right. Now, we talk about that. You ever think of why there was a cliff? What was the cliff all about? Well, again, in reading up a little bit more about this, basically, even when they would take someone to stone them outside the courtroom in Jerusalem, they would build a platform or wherever they were within the countryside. If they would, you know, because they didn't just have all these capital, you know, crimes come down to Jerusalem. They could happen throughout the whole country. And the, uh, the, the, the judges that were in the country at the, at the time in the various places, okay? But they'd build a platform twice the height of an individual. Okay, And the first thing they would do is they would have that individual stand there facing the one that has accused them 
and the guilty person would stand there. The accuser then would hit, take him by the hips and push him off, or her off, okay, and have them fall down. And if the person fell down and was killed in that, no stoning, no further stoning was necessary. But if the person happened to be alive, okay, that person who pushed them also would take the first stone and put it into the chest, trying to kill the individual. Sounds very gruesome, doesn't it? Okay. But again, it also carries a lot of weight. If I'm going to accuse somebody, I have also have to do the dirty deed. So I better be very sure. I was going to say something else. I better be very sure that I want to convict somebody of a crime and that they've done it. Okay. And so the first one would throw the stone, and if that killed them, no further stones. But if it didn't, then the whole group would take their stones and finish them off. And then there's some other things about tying them to trees and the cross and uh, you know, there's all some other fun stuff in there. I'll save that for another day and try to get in what I want to get in tonight. Okay? But again, in Nazareth, when they went to the cliff, okay, yeah, they were going to stone him to death, as it were, but the first thing, push him off. Push him off the cliff, and if that kills him, okay, we're done. None of us has to pick up a stone and throw it if he gets pushed off the cliff. But Jesus, as he was getting approaching the cliff, somehow, and again, through the Holy Spirit, miraculously got him out of that crowd, and then therefore they weren't able to stone him. All right? But in any case, two witnesses, and uh, again, they had to be the ones that would cast the first stone. And if the witness was untruthful, and I've talked to you about this already, they were the ones who would have to suffer the punishment of what they were accusing the other individual of committing. So if you are perjuring and lying on the witness stand, you will receive the punishment of the individual uh, 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 for the crime that you were accusing another individual of. Plainly, that's in the law in the book of Leviticus. We've noted that, Deuteronomy. And then we see the witnesses coming forward in Matthew and in Mark. And in this case, they had two witnesses come forward that said, he'll destroy the temple in three days and raise it up again. He's guilty then. He's guilty. Those two individuals who ever said that, they should have been the ones that were nailing Jesus to the cross. Okay? But again, they weren't operating by the law at this point in time. They were just winging it so that they could uh, get their, uh, their just desserts as they wanted them. All right, so in regard to this, in cases of capital law, it says if in the Mishnah, it says if one testifies falsely, the blood of the accused and the blood of his offspring that he did not merit to produce, <laughs> kind of interesting, are ascribed to the witness's testimony until eternity. <laughs> so what does that say? The, the individual plus the generations he could have had are now condemned. So in other words, he gets put to death, and because he's not able to progenate any more children, those that he could have progenated are also committed, again, in a kind of a, uh, a metaphorical sense, also suffering under the law and having capital crime because they never came into being, as it were. Okay, So kind of interesting how they take it, not just to the individual, but they take it further down to generations that that individual, male or female, could have had that they will not have. Kind of interesting. Witnesses, testimony until eternity. Now in uh, number 13. Again, I have 18 all together, so let me get these in. These next few go pretty quick. The accused had to have a friend in court to defend him. Jesus had none. Even the Sanhedrin uh, members like Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, you know, they weren't there standing up for him. He didn't have his own defense attorney. He didn't have anybody there defending him, his brothers, his sisters, his apostles. They didn't give him anybody to help defend him. That alone illegitimizes the trial. And so therefore, in these passages, we see Jesus standing alone. Then number, f number uh, 14. No one can accuse himself. No one can accuse himself of a crime. And that's why in our jurisprudence, uh, 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 the, the accused does not have to go on the witness stand. Okay? And they don't have to say, I did it or I didn't do it. Okay? 
They have the right to be silent, okay? They had that right in that court as well. And even if they did say something, that was not evidence to condemn them. Now, what happened to Jesus Christ? Are you the Son of God then? Yes, I am. Blasphemy! What more do we need? Let's kill him right now. Oh, no, you can't do that. Came from his own mouth. <laughs> Came from his own mouth. You can't accuse him. Oh, excuse me. You can't condemn him for his words, even if he says it. Again, we see him uh, doing the self-condemnation, as it were, but really it's not a condemnation. Self-glorification. Yes, I am. I am. I am the one. Then in uh, verse 15, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, point 15, it says the high priest is not allowed to grandstand. Caiaphas tore his robes and accused uh, Christ of blasphemy. Okay? Oh, what more evidence do we need? And he tore off, he rent his clothes off, as they would do, you know, if there was a great disturbance and something that was very egregious. He put on a big show. What more do we need? I'm tearing my clothes. And it's kind of funny how he rent his clothes in two. What did God do? He rent the temple curtain in two in a true, just, and righteous renting and lamenting. <laughs> it's kind of interesting when you do the comparison between the two. So again, Matthew and Mark speak to that grandstanding. Now, uh, the 16th point, the judges are not allowed to assault the accused, okay? But as we noted on Thursday, uh, Tuesday of this week, they hit him, they beat him, they spit upon him. Sometimes it was the officers, but these passages also tell us they were the priests that were hitting him as well. So again, some of these individuals were on the Sanhedrin who hit Jesus Christ. They disqualified themselves as judges. And if they sat as judges, again, the whole trial is null and void. Number 17, and I've got one more after this. If, if with a capital crime the decision is unanimous against the accused, the case is actually thrown out. Do you recognize that? It's kind of interesting. If the entire body of 71 said he's guilty, and unanimously we find guilt in him, the case gets thrown out. Again, because God knows man. <laughs> and it can't be that cut and dry in the eyes of man, in the sinful nature that we are. So there had to be at least a few that were dissenting opinions. But yet the majority, and it wasn't a one-person majority, it was, had to be several people a, a majority, they could then find guilt, and then it would stand. But if they all did, case is thrown out. And in these passages, they unanimously found guilt in Jesus, and all together they dragged him before Pilate, accusing him. So again, that legitim illegitimized the trial. What does the missioner read on that? The missioner reads in cases of capital law, all those present at the trial may teach a reason to acquit the accused, but not all present may teach a reason to find him liable. Okay? Some interesting old English type of language, but again, teach a reason to find him liable. They all can't do it. If they all say he's liable, he's guilty, case case is thrown out of court or it's retried or something like that so they did that with jesus illegitimizing this trial number 18 when the sanhedrin took jesus before pilate hoping for a death sentence to be carried out according to the roman law they changed the charges first it's blasphemy he says he's the son of god he says he's the messiah he's the king of israel and then when pilate says well that's not my problem <laughs> that's yours that's your problem not mine. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, no, he, 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 treason. Treason, he says not to pay taxes to Caesar. And these were some of the false witnesses that came against him. Jesus didn't say that. He said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar. Render unto God what is God's. He never said, don't pay your taxes. But yet the false accusation was treason. Don't pay your taxes. And so they changed it from blasphemy to treason so that Pilate would go along with it. And even with that, Pilate's like, I don't want anything to do with this, okay? Because I don't find anything wrong with this guy. I took him in, and he even Pilate spoke to him individually, which, again, now you're in the Roman court. That's something different. But, again, individual, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, questioning was illegal by the Jewish law. But in this case, again, they changed the verdict to try to get a favorable outcome of Jesus' death. And even that didn't work. And then basically it came down to trading Barabbas for Jesus Christ because it was the Passover celebration. And typically even that was wrong too because basically before you'd just release a prisoner. You wouldn't trade him off for another one. But in this case they traded Jesus for Barabbas. Again, the whole doctrine of the scapegoat. Okay, Another doctrine for another day. So in regard to all this, other glaring, you know, uh, disregards to the law was the decision to take Jesus before Herod too because King Herod had absolutely no jurisdiction in this matter whatsoever. And this is why Herod, again, not just that he got bored with Jesus because he wouldn't say or do anything for us, but he sent him back to Pilate. He really had no jurisdiction in any of this. That too was a scam and uh, a, a part of the hypocrisy of these trials. And so what happened to Jesus Christ was highly illegal under the law of his day, under the law of, uh, uh, under the Mosaic law, and then the oral, of, of Mishnah as we now have it written down, the oral law. That's how they applied the law of Moses. And while we can look back at those religious leaders, uh, the Roman civilian authorities and the mob, again, how did they actually convict Jesus? Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. They didn't find him guilty of anything. They just said, we want him dead. And they forced Pilate to kill him because they wanted it. And the Bible makes it clear that the collective sin of all humanity is really what brought Jesus Christ to the cross. Again, and ultimately, even though we have all this illegality, that we see the corruption of these trials, as we see corruption even in our day and age, remember, it's all according to God's will and God's plan. And God's will and God's plan was for Jesus Christ to go to the cross in any way he could get there. And he couldn't go there legitimately because he had no sin of his own. So God knew that he would get there illegally by these false judges and these criminals. And God used their evil to bring about good. And God still does that today. He brings about the evil of the world to bring about good. And he can do that. And he does it all the time. Because the good was that Jesus Christ would come into the world, go to the cross, and pay the penalty for the sins of the entire world, as John three sixteen, uh, John chapter three sixteen and eighteen uh, tells us. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that was the plan all along. So we see the condemnation of the Jewish leadership in what they did. But we understand how God used their evil and used their corruption, used Satan even in the, uh, in the possession of Judas to make all sh sure these things got going and got in play. God even used Satan to bring about the greater good of Jesus Christ going to the cross to die for our sins. Now, with that, though, don't get any ideas. Don't think that you can perform evil for the greater good, okay? It doesn't work for us, okay? only works for God. Because he knows all things. And he works all things together for good for those who love him. Jesus Christ loved him. All things work together for good. Even though he went through horrific trials and tribulations and the scourging that we're going to begin to study on Sunday as we now get into Pontius Pilate's trials and the great scourgings that happened prior to the cross of Jesus Christ. All right, so that concludes... Luke 22. Now we'll get into Luke 23 when we come back on Sunday. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for helping us to understand what our Lord went through and therefore have a, even a greater appreciation for what he endured on our behalf. The suffering, uh, the humiliation, and the great difficulty that he endured both physically, mentally, and then spiritually upon the cross so that we could have salvation. So, Father, we thank you for his great work. We thank him for all that he has done and for the love that you both have sh uh, shared with us here in this world. So, Father, we ask that you give us travel blessings on our way home this evening. In Christ's name, amen.